We are now joined by Jibish Bakhti, Monica Narola, and Shida Bruta Sangupta from Nox Media Collective for their lecture performance titled Constellating the Human, Politics, Creativity, and a Canopy of Solidarities. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you very much in the beginning to Hur al Qasimi, to the March meeting, to all of you gathered here for this opportunity to, for us to listen to this very intense day of thinking about collectives, collectivity. As a collective of 32 years, it's always, it's very heartening for us to, to have this attention paid to a form of being and practice that we want to think further with you today. Shape-shifting, proliferating protagonism. Collectivity in a fraught time. We learned during our thinking about this presentation that we will make to you today, our thoughts, that the word tawashajat in Arabic, which like a canopy is something we are gathered under here today, also means or can mean, and this is the wonderful thing about Arabic, that words can stretch to many meanings, entwining, entanglement, braiding, a knot. In answering the question of the role that collectives can play in our time, which was the starting point of the conversation that brought us to the March meeting, we found ourselves shape-shifting towards knots and entanglements. A knot is bound, tied up with itself or with something else. For a wandering thread, perhaps an arbor knot. To unravel, why not a clinch knot? And a blood knot to avoid a clot. Patience is the silent name of a fisherman's knot. The perfection loop is always at the edge of being undone. A promise arrives with the true lover's knot. A knot is a knot when it cannot unravel. And as a marine measure of speed, a knot suggests how speedily something moves away. The knots that bind are the knots that fray. Mathematically speaking, a knot is simply a co closed curve in space that can move by stretching, shrinking, and twisting. A collective, too, is a dynamic form, a shapeshifter, a time twister. It finds its protagonism, its ability to influence time and transform circumstances by changing its form and function. In its most elementary form, a knot is a tie, something that folds and twists around itself. A collective is time twining people around themselves in time. This bundle has never been opened, writes a group of young writers who call themselves Saiba Mohalla. This bundle has never been opened. It has been passed from generation to generation. It is yours now. Don't ever undo its knot. Towards the knot, a hundred kilometers from here, there is a night shelter. It has a door at its entrance. Let the door remain there. At the border is a room measuring 10 by 20 meters. It has many holes. That room is the sole witness of time that has passed there. In it, you will see all those nights of the world that have been spent without sleep. Everything, the sky, the ocean, paths, distances, caravans of stranger make everything, make it your own. A knot in time. When you make everything your own, a time becomes more than itself. It is no longer just a time. It no longer bridges the shortest distance between two moments in a given interval. This is because the two or three or more people, in the case of a collective, take time into multiple temporal places because every person experiences the passage of the same time differently. That is why suddenly, by passing over or under itself, the collective produces a multiplication of planes, of dimensions, of time, traveling simultaneously at different speeds, responding to different frequencies and wavelengths, answering to the call of distinct rhythms, 
producing a music laden with syncopation, with harmony, with dissonance, with calls and responses looping back and forth. The collective singularity or distinction is also its multiplicity, its complication, its implication, its complicity with itself and with its environment and its time. Analogously, we could take this to mean that the collective is an instrument that can respond to urgency as well as play the long game. It can do this by distributing its attention along different temporal registers where one person picks up the contagious beat of the moment, another does firefighting, another catches or tackles or dribbles a passing ball, another dance and mends, while yet another scans distant horizons or collects the just arriving light of long dead stars. Moreover, these roles need not be fixed. Today's wielder of the darning needle may be tomorrow's firefighter, and the astronomer of the day forever after tomorrow. The collective is the intersection of darning and astronomy. Fraught time. Could we then speak about a specific relationship between a collective, the world, space, and time? This world and our time is fraught and frayed fraught with provocations, with violence, with the hunger, thirst, and despair of besieged populations in all the places we can name, because they haunt our headlines, and we have named some of them today, and our social media feeds, and in some places we cannot name, because even the memories of their occurrence as news has been eclipsed already. Fraught, did I hear fraught? Fraught, what a word, fraught. Fraught comes from freight. Anyone who has shipped art to a distant exhibition knows a lot about freightage. And if you know your freight, you know your fraught. In fact, we could think of fraught as a past tense of freight, of load, of cargo. We could say that the ship of our time has ended up carrying more cargo than it can bear. Some people think that the Earth is now an overloaded ship. But the, there could be another way of looking at this thickening. The spatial, ecological, and life processes related challenges of these situations of crowding are just beginning to be thought about seriously. It makes for concentrations of intelligence but also for crowds that can be easily manipulated. It makes for new forms of politics and old forms of power. The story of Pamphilos and Metis. Once, a few years back in Athens, in particular, we found many creative ways in which citizens were reshaping the commons of the city in the aftermath of the Greek economy crisis to form self-help groups, clinics, schools, gardens. It was the density of the city, often seen otherwise as a source of many of the problems, that turned out unsurprisingly as a source of the density of connection within the city that was also a saving grace. Athens was shaped by an internal matrix. So many other cities, including our own Delhi, when COVID caught governmental mechanisms totally off guard. What saved lives at the time of crisis was, who knew how many people and how quickly could that network get access to and distribute oxygen cylinders? We need not see this only as a response to the collapse of the economy but, and the state. We can also see them as anticipation of the future marked by the liveliness of the commons of all kind. But first, a diversion, a brief but deep dive into the submarine archaeology. Friends are those who share things in common. In the Athens Archaeological Museum, we came across a vitrine that was displayed a drinking cup for wine, found in an ancient shipwreck of the island of Antikera. It was, it had, it, the word written on it was pamphilos, etched around its rim. 
Pamphilos, a name signifying a person who could be a friend of all? Or is it just a way of saying that passing a cup of wine between hands is a marker of the common bond of friendship? When we found Pamphilos, we also met archaeologists and deep sea divers. We met scholars, poets, teachers, migrants, doctors, nurses, researchers, dramaturgs, lawyers, and pharmacists. We met people tending to the shipwreck of the everyday, of the scavenging capitalism in free clinics, in hospitals, in volunteer and language schools, in self-organized cafes, and parking lots turned into parks. It was a lesson in diving into an ongoing massive experiment with living that has occupied the time of an entire planet, even while it is besieged. Metis, goddess of contingent knowledge, daughter of the sea, patron of the skill and knowledge of sailors, swallowed by the fearful Zeus, appeared in our conversation as a form of intelligence that confronts the permanence and universality of dominant sovereign power. In finding Metis, we found the possibility, the sensibility of the practical wisdom of Pamphilos, of the collective. The work of lightening the burden of an overloaded ship is done by stevedores in dockyards. And the work of mending frayed threads is done by darners in workshops. Both stevedoring and darning have a culture of knots and rope and thread. Both are occupations with histories of forms of collective practice. Steve Doring is best done in teams, and darners, especially when working on complex fabrics like tapestries and carpets, work in groups that evolve complex rituals of signaling and internal communication. Stevedores know how to tie the exact kind of knot, naturally the stevedores knot, that will offset load, work rope, with or against gravity while making heavy cargo on while moving heavy cargo onto and from ships without getting frayed and do what is necessary to keep things secure and in place darners on the other hand know how to pass thread such that the knots that they, the knots they make while tying frayed bits of fabric together are barely visible or even invisible to the naked eye. This is a kind of invisible mending. A repair in the fabric of time that needs a constancy and concentration of delicate attention to be invisible. To undertake this procedure, the expert dana does not just respond to torn fabric. They anticipate points of weakness and potential distress and begin working away at their edges in a way that is quite the opposite of the mode of patchwork, cut and paste attempt to repair the site of sudden collapse. A darner is not just reacting to the distress of time with a series of one-time patchwork or first aid jobs. Rather, they are taking steps to ensure that the conditions that can alleviate, address, or prevent distress are constantly in motion not in a reactive crisis-driven mode, but in an anticipatory mode. Not impelled by rage, but building instead on the basis of long-term observation, comparison between the qualities of the causes and outcomes of different crises, as well as analysis, and most importantly, empathy. Can we rest our understanding of what it takes to be human today by making humanity itself a matter of woven thread? A forgetting, a forgetting of air. What is it that binds us together? It could be an understanding of what we are all missing, a forgetting of the air that is in and around us. It could be an epiphany of what courses through us, freedom and confinement, sickness and healing, or what we create with our hands, gardens and food, or what passes between us in language and poetry. The artworks we construct out of these concepts include the performance of conversations between different kinds of protagonists that we had met earlier, the ones that Jibesh referred to in Athens. It was the sea, it was salt, it was medicine, words, and silence. 
These conversations seasoned everyday realities with philosophical observations and visionary observations unfolded across five evenings during a fraught city in a frayed time. Frayed? Did I hear frayed? Frayed. What a word, frayed. Frayed comes from the old French frayer, worn down, unraveled by friction, especially in fabric. When we encounter the threads of our time coming undone by too much wear and tear, by decay, decomposition, distress and injury, by conflict, both internal and external, then we can think of our time as frayed. A frayed time is time worn down, in need of mending, like this, our time. The Molecular Human. Some years ago, we made a work called The Coarse Fabric of Being Human, a meditation on human beings at a molecular level. It took as its starting point a hypothetical figure known as the sterner elsa molecular formula, formula for a human being. This speculative construction seeks to render the human as a molecule. It distills the chemical constituents of the human body into a single molecule. This imaginary molecule is composed of the 21 elements that make up all our flesh and bone, all our blood and sweat and tears, all our spirit and almost all our shine. This is the individuated human body rendered as a collective of constituent, uh, of constituent elements. A rendition of this imagined uh, molecules was performed as an arrangement of seating forms, an invitation to, to other human beings to sit, to lie, to sleep and rest and think about their own molecular nature. By analogy, this gives us another way to understand the transformable texture of time. It is the density of knots, of connections, that are marked within a time that makes for its texture. What is the texture of our collective humanity? Proliferating protagonism. While on the surface, this may indeed be a time marked by the rise of authoritarian politics of all varieties, but it is also true that the not density of this time, characterized by the proliferation of incidents, entities, tendencies, and fluxes of all kinds of non-hierarchical modes of practice, of being, and of self-organization, is also at an all-time high. Within authoritarian structures, the velocity of authority from center to periphery in a given network is much higher than the density of connections between nodes in that network. While it is true that social media platforms tend to accelerate authoritarian tendencies and cults of personality through, um, through a vectoral amplification of means and commands, there is also the fact that the internet's founding promise and premise of decentralization also keeps finding multiple iterations. Samizdat begets Samizdat. Anonymizers, the rise of hand-to-hand -hand sharing through shared passwords, traveling USB sticks, various other examples of this kind create different kinds of networks of action and intention. Perhaps this is also a time of proliferating protagonists. There is perhaps a new undergrowth and a new overstory of signs and signals. Deltaic ecology. Perhaps what we are proposing is a deltaic ecology of the way in which we approach the question of collective practice. Our practice works its way through an interplay between what we call sources and their flux and a binding through procedures of co-inhabiting trajectories and tendencies. A river can have a source or more than one source, but it is in its coursing that the streaming and rousing water becomes a river, an ecological and a cultural geography of life and imagination. 
In its journey to the sea, it divides into tributaries and is joined by streams of rivers that begin in other sources. These are riverine islands. The river changes courses, ebbs and flows. When it meets the sea, it often creates a rich and fragile deltaic ecology. We locate sources that excites us with ideas, concepts, images, or states of feeling that are accreted in our own journey. This constellation is arrived at partly by research into the history, fables, topography, economy of a particular place or a network, partly by instinct and partly from the sparks and spins of the constant churning between and within us. We draw them in and place them alongside each other in non-rivalrous, non-hierarchical relationships. This process leads to the formation of streams of multiplying materials, images and correspondences. Continued interaction between source and streams create a landscape, a terrain. This terrain takes shape both inside our minds and in that it's exterior to us. It is then in this intersubjective world that the somatic, the affective, the conceptual relays through, through continuous interrupted and deferred translations be, becoming a material event that can inhabit the space and time of an exhibition or a process or a habitat. Five million incidents. A few years ago, we found ourselves as catalysts and custodians, we choose to use that framing rather than of being curators in this instance, of a process we designated as five million incidents in Delhi and in Kolkata at the invitation of the Goethe Institute. We responded to this invitation by proposing what we called an occupation of time within the precincts of the institutes in Delhi and Kolkata. This proposition was presented to artists as an invitation, as a beckoning, the terms of this call also spoke to time, to this time. And I'll read from the call. Our time is active with cascading micro tremors, daily seismic shifts and the occasional upheaval. Nothing stands still, nothing ever has. The ground underneath is fluid, the sky above is changing. There is something we cannot yet name in the air, but we know that it is changing us and that it is changed by us. Events and processes of varied tone and intensity, joyous, bitter, curious, inventive, fertile, angry, thoughtful, convivial, and questioning manifest themselves in an increasing frequency of incidents and accidents. They flash and flicker in our consciousness, asking to be counted. We could play at counting this uncountable plenitude and call it five million or five million and one incidents. Why? Because five million is a big, unwieldy, but handy number. A metaphor for plenitude, a cipher for abundance. And because one can always add a single digit to any big number and make it slightly bigger. Because there must always be room, even in a metaphor, for more. Because five million and one makes each one feel that they are that one. What would it take to translate the audacity of this account of the uncountable onto a space and a span of time? What would it mean to make room for infinity within the framework of a compact and concrete design? The design of this process would feature the organic development of a dense web of linkages expressed as incidents, between actions, occurrences, and presentational formats that connect discrete practices, disciplines, and strands of discursivity or conversation across the time span of a year or more to create a new cultural ecology. Incidents could cantilever, collapse, collide, cathect, and cascade onto each other and be connected in concentric, contiguous, and cumulative ways. This could mean that incidents spread across the year or a season or any cluster of time will find and produce different kinds of points of contact with each other. Nevertheless, a rare body of incidents could also flourish entirely by themselves as singularities. The curatorial effort 
the custodial effort will be to produce a new kind of experience of time, duration and frequency, as well as new patterns of focus and concentration of materials and ideas. Um, collectives have a crucial function here. Collectivity as knot formation. Collectives form the knots within the ecosystem of knot densities. They can self-design to become recursive in the, way that, in the way that they are linking and tangling with each other. This can lead to knots of knots and tangles of tangles. Collectives can also become federations. Federations can become systems, systems that beget and sustain entire ecologies and orders of time. But how do we create an order of time? How do you decide between one moment and another? This is an order that can never be imposed from above. We all know that it grows each time from below. If we take each number to be a person, then every person's significance is determined by the recognition of their significance by those next to them, and so on. A collective echoes one person's value by resonance to another person's value in a chain of resonating resonances. The replication of this principle through a system effectively ensures that there can never be a centralized determination of significance. But what does that prove, and why does it matter? Because every number is dependent on every other number in the series. No number in, for example, the Fibonacci series can exist without its predecessors, and all numbers are equally, yet also uniquely, expressive of the underlying relationship that ties them together. We could begin, as we did in 2011, by calling this the arithmetic of the last international, the collective of collectives, and then we could move on. We could move on from one, two, three. One, ready rise. Two, steady refuse. Three, go rejoice. One, two, three, infinity. With the number three, the first wild card, the first odd prime, our account of the world takes us out of the interlocked prison of the dyad of either opposition or reflection or echo. Three is the key move as well as the option out of the treadmill of the dialectic. With three, we enjoin plurality. We enjoin plenitude. And we ascend the order of the calculus. It is with three that we begin to glimpse infinity. One, ready, scramble. Two, steady, stand. Three, go and propose. It has room for everyone. There are no deficits. There are no losses to measure against gains. No lesser evils or greater goods. One, ready, laugh. Two, steady, revolt. Three, go and create. Everything that we think about the future is actually only a projection of our attitudes towards the present. We tend to think in the present continuous sense. This means that we see the future as being present in the present day. One needs not to take for granted what one considers the basic requirement of human life to be. And time cooks us all. We know the story of the riddle-bearing yaksha, so we will share it with you. A riddle-bearing yaksha, a wayward water spirit, disguised as a stork who asked the lost king Yudhishthir in a Mahabharata episode, Tata Kim, Kim Varta, and then, what is the news? We know that Yudhishthir replied, Asmin Mahamohamaye Katahe, Suryagnina Ratri Devendhanena, Masartu Darvi Parighattanena Bhutani Kalha Pachatiti Varta, which means, in this cauldron of delusion, with the sun as its fire, night and day as fuel, months and seasons as stirring ladle, time cooks us all. That is the news. This process of cooking can congeal grains into a paste. It can also reduce a paste into its ingredients. Things can come apart and become alloyed. 
because every knot is a complication that occurs within a thing when it encounters itself in a particular way. The expression, I felt tied up in knots, while gesturing to confusion or discomfort or hesitation is an admission of feeling both divided and multiplied at the same time. It marks, at the very least, that there is more than one voice continuing within each one of us. Even alone, we are a cloud, a crowd. Even in crowds, we feel alone. And what happens to the thread of the self in a time of knots? Where does that self go? We, we all think that the, that the word individual is a, re, is, a, is a relatively recent arrival on the world historical stage. The idea of a monadic, atomized self as a self-conscious subject may be outliving its shelf life, especially as technologies create greater possibilities of network living. But the more interesting thing for us is to consider the possibility of networked expressions of person of interest and of subjectivity. Naturally, such a situation also demands a new ethics. This is neither the ethics of an easily named conglomerate like a nation or a community, nor is it the ethics of the solitary subject. What we are aware of is the need for a surge, for a transcultural, trans, interpersonal, and intrapersonal ethics. For the surge to be read by another, it has to first be written into the work, for example, by an artist. The work of the artist, for example, comes up again and again against inadequate vocabularies, against repertoires of experience made up as much of silence as they are of words. Often what needs to be talked through is a cluster of feelings, a confusion of memories, and an overlap of times and senses. Perhaps in art, as in life, these phenomena are always available to us only in inconsistent and contradictory and ambivalent, even enigmatic terms, as knots. Now, what is a word but an image or sound of a thought, and what is a thought but the mental or virtual image of an experience? When we make images and words and sounds, we are constructing real images out of, out of virtuality. We are striking sounds out of unstruck sounds. These processes, or we could call them again knots, act as reminders of the continuing need to turn and twist thoughts as queries and as speculations that act both as provocations and as repositories of the muscle memory of thought itself. Here are two images of our time, for our time, that act as questions or knots. Is time a bomb or a bomb shelter? Having asked the question, let's put one half of, of it aside as a health and safety measure. Let's stop treating time as if it was a bomb, a time bomb, and to explode when the hour hand and the minute hand meets at a prime predetermined point of detonation and view it instead as a canopy, as something to have take shelter in, to gather under, to be together in. With the world in a perpetual state of turmoil, this concept offers a point to departure for challenging the view of collectivity as relating to a mere temporal explosion or as a sense of transient response as we leap from one crisis to another in this our incendiary times. So from knot to canopy, we move from the knot to the canopy. The term canopy, in the sense in which we invoke it, draws its sense and disposition from the many practices of gathering, in joy, togetherness, and anger that the world has witnessed and is witnessing that begin just before the pandemic hit, where suspended is the world into lockdown, and are now beginning to find fertile ground again. It takes time for a forest to form its undergrowth and its canopy. Specifically, we find anchorage for the canopies form in the colorful tent canopies, we call them shamianas that marked our city, Delhi, as spaces to gather under during the citizenship congregations led by women in the winter of 2019 and early 2020. 
In Delhi, not far from the campus of our alma mater, Jamia Millia Islamia University, in the adjacent neighborhood of Shaheen Bagh, over a few months from December 2019 to March 2020, there was a highway blockade sit-in against the proposed Citizenship Amendment Act. The roads and walls next to the protest site, as well as all over the university campus and its library, became a giant canvas. Drawings, paintings, sculptures, installations appeared and disappeared, as did an armada of paper boats with poems. Almost daily, they would melt away, but would be redrawn and remade again and again. Soon, every city in India found its own Shaheen Bagh. The ferman spread to students, to workers, to farmers, to refugees. The spaces under the canopies became stages, schools, libraries, playgrounds, feasts, salons, rites of passage, an embrace of ferments. Nobody asked anyone to do any of this. No one set an agenda, no one offered explanations, no one rationalized what might or might not happen. An informal roster of performers and speakers traveled through WhatsApp messages and each night, different sets of people spoke, sang, read poetry, and performed a different protest site. At Kajuri, for instance, a rough neighborhood across the river in Delhi, an entire protest site managed by students from Delhi's College of Art emerged almost spontaneously. At Delhi's Azad Market, a sign proclaimed, Welcome to Azad Market Protest Site Art Gallery. And it featured flex prints of everything from children's drawings to Instagram posts all tied with rope to a railing for display. People took selfies of themselves next to photographs of pitched battles with the police on a college campus. Ambitious murals appeared on the road and the walls of a university campus, even as student protests against police violence accelerated. People appeared. No one called them. They came anyway. Schoolgirls shade the stage with eminent poets. Everyone was listened to. Everyone found their voice. Deliberation found its arena. Everything is burning. Dislocation, discontent, and disruption are indicators of normalcy. These are the signs of our times. We live in the energy field that we call the world. Doubt of constituted authority is also a kind of energy, something that ignites consciousness into vigilance and alertness. It marks the capacity of an entity to be its own source of light. Let us call this auto-luminosity, an index of our awareness of the inscription of the energy of questioning into every waking and sleeping and dreaming moment. We had marked this in a work that we um, call Provisions for Everybody in the Kesariya Stupa in Bihar as the site where the Buddha's sermon in praise of doubt, the Kalama Sutta, or the discourse to the Kalamas, which provides philosophical anchorage for radical skepticism towards all forms of constituted authority. In this site in Kesariya, a series of headless Buddhas decapitated icon friezes of seated Buddhas on the outer walls of this two and a half thousand year old, um, oldest brick uh, stupa that is known, um, showed us <laughs> how not to lose our heads. It is not known when they were decapitated, but estimates point to almost a millennium ago. By drawing this form of the Buddha image in fire, and by inscribing the keywords Sabbam Adittam, everything is burning, of the Aditta Pariyaya Sutta, the fire sermon, we invite anyone who witnesses this work to face the danger and delight and consequence of an intimacy with energy. To do this is not to turn one's face away from the everything that is burning, which is desire or delusion as doubt, as per the accepted understanding of the import of the fire sermon. Rather, it is to face the consequences of figuring out how we ourselves are constantly becoming the fuel of the life processes, which are biological and social and technological, 
that we consume and that in turn consume us. Everything ignites, everything combusts, all things radiate. Every use of energy that we, that we do, that we are, that we become, needs to be a deliberative act. And every deliberative act must shine autoluminous with its own light. Associative glimmer. Increasingly, we are looking at the capacity of art practice is to enact itself associatively, invite exacting scenarios, it builds spirited milieus, it innovates on protocols and thinks through the thresholds, unleashes out of the habit, not yet tested forms of performativity and utterance. We call all of this the associative glimmer in our world of practice around us. The lasting radiance of these instances helps us understand why an economically marginal practice like contemporary art generates so much unease and insecurity. Why structures of wealth and power are so keen to subdue or seduce its presence. It is no wonder then it has to become a site of illumination, but also a source of anxiety and discomfort. Associative glimmer depends on the activation of an imaginary, an ethic, and a practice of life that occurs within intermittent temporal margins. These margins are not geographical because there is no geography external to capital anymore. These are not, there is nothing much in the world left out of it. Associative glimmer is a sub-epidermal glow. Associative glimmer is a sub-epidermal flow. Ontoshira. Ontoshira is a virtually untranslatable and uncommon Bengali word that can be used to speak of an intrinsic glow and pervasiveness of a sensory layer which flows within our daily lives, a sub-epidermal glow. It is found in specialized medical literature and a few obscure Bengali medical dictionaries where it is taken to mean intravenous. Ontoshira, or intravenous, is like the energy currents of the nervous system, like chi. It shapes life in all its extensibility. Today, the world needs to draw sustenance and inspiration and strength from within varied ontoshira, our intrinsic pervasive forces that flow between all of us as we refashion relationships between the microcosms of singular lives, the connected life of the planet, and the macrocosm of the universe. It is intriguing and instructive to think of ontoshira in terms of a flow that is ubiquitous and subtle, close to and under the skin, but invisible to the naked eye. It is capable of profoundly affecting the body through which it occurs, but remains largely misunderstood. Like the presence of the bacterial forms Saccharomyces and Lactobacillus in our mouths, in our guts, in our vaginas, which ferment subcutaneously, intravenously, and are vital to the health of the vagus nerve and the nervous system, we need substances that elevate consciousness, sometimes causing intoxication, sometimes satiety, sometimes inspired forms of vitality. Our Ibn Sina says, if stone was once alive, with fur bristling and claw unsheathed, then life too can be petrified and be sculpted into a sign awaiting a lucky reader. Someday our smiles will be frozen. Our tears will carve dry riverbeds like shale. Like deep sea fish frozen into the rock of high mountains, we will be puzzles and anomalies awaiting the future paleontologist who will plumb our depths at their summits. Between the dry tears of the dying robot and the absent smile of the glowing hologram lie the secrets of our time. I am the bitter tears of the widow's heart. I am the joy in the lover's tears on meeting her beloved. There are also waves in the tear ducts of our eyes. These waves can be calm or smooth, slight or moderate, 
rough, very rough, high, very high, phenomenal. And tears are not only from weeping. Make me a story that walks by the mile, with more salt than your tears, more sweet than a smile. Let us listen to stories and tell stories collectively in the light of all our screens and campfires. This is how we found language and song and art and became human, and let us try and stay that way. Thank you. I have no idea what happens now. <laughs> if you have any questions or thoughts, we can, we can respond to them, or we can just be together, <laughs> whatever you like. Thank you very much, that was really beautiful. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you write, your, write these kind of poetic works together, how that works as a collective? How, the, how does the work? How you, how you write a certain text like that and becomes a performance together. You know, <laughs> we're working now for 32 years and I don't... <laughs> Uh, I think uh, we don't write, we keep on drafting. So there is, a, there is a process that over a period of time we start understanding that the drafting is continuous. Like this text has many parts from many uh, artworks, thinking, conversation, interviews, and it starts weaving and then rewriting again on something. So it's this continuous process of making that is going on and a present or a talk like this, sometimes it's an interruption to that process to produce something, and then it keeps on moving. Uh, so it's a... Darning. Do you use the term darning? Yeah. I think there's a lot of darning and some astronomy. And but some I, yeah, but I also want to say that this business of iteration, of, of repetition, that may not always give you what you want, right? You don't, sometimes you don't know what you want, Sometimes you repeat because you're not getting what you want. And it is this process of repetition and iteration that is, at heart, it has no intention. It is because it needs to be done as well. And I think that part, the sort of, the everyday part of being a collective or any form of, uh, of expressivity that is this continuity of, of not letting yourself stop even though it seems like it's not working. Uh, and, and the fact that it's an exhausting but necessary part of the of the method is is like darning, I suppose. But iteration is necessary. Okay, this is. <clears throat> I just wanted to go back to that slide that you were showing in the background, um, and I think there was an image of knots, that many different knots that you were showing, but I sim somehow could not help but think about knots which can, if they become too close, too tight, they can also squeeze the life out of you. I don't know, I just thought that if you had any thoughts about that, and the reason I'm asking is, um, when I think about the collective, I always also think a little fearfully, because I know that collectives can also turn into mobs. Collectives can also become something which can suffocate you. So the point is that how do you make it work so that it becomes something which nurtures you, something which connects you but doesn't suffocate you? I don't know if it makes sense, but these are just thoughts which came to my mind. Um, 
Um, it's very nice that the idea of a collectivity as anxiety is creating a lot of excitement. But I think... <laughs> I, I mean, and there is truth to what you say, obviously, right? I mean, there is absolutely truth to what you say because um, a knot too tight, which cannot be unraveled, um, can feel like um, can feel like something which blocks. Perhaps you want to, you don't want entangled thread. Perhaps you want a, a clean, smooth piece of thread with which you can embroider. And I have been through that. You know, I, you know, you try and do anything with thread, and it knots. So when you don't want it to knot, it creates challenges. But I think it's precisely that fact. That we, we began to think of this question of entanglement, right? How is it possible to think of oneself without the other? So it, can, it doesn't have to be consciously formulated. You don't have to be in a collective. But I think whenever you start to reflect on what makes you you, the result is always a history of entanglement. Right? And we began to think of what is an acknowledgement of entanglement? What is an awareness of entanglement? that provides us a material translation, permits us to extend from the intangible to the tangible with the frustrations that, the ta that tangibility demands, right? That's a great thing about, I mean, oh, that is the truth of tangibility. It will not be passed into words. It cannot be. You have to deal with the physicality of things. And that is why I think when we were trying, to, and the knots that you see were actually made of glass. We have been trying to think of this materialization in, 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 in a material that actually does not lend itself to not making. Glass is the opposite of, tact, of, of fluidity, of, of that kind of entanglement, and it often leads to breakage and fracture and cracks. And that itself has been a fascinating process. When you say to yourself, A, I'm going to materialize it, B, I'm going to try and materialize it in forms that are actually not tensile at all. And I think that those things about suffocation are also true. Uh, when you can feel too constricted, and I think this, but this question of nurturing, of care, of the fact that, like I was saying earlier, iteration, you know, it's, it's, it, you have to keep doing it, and it is, a, it is, a, 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 it is a, um, it, attritive, but also in its repetition is the only possibility that it has. It cannot be done once. Only when you make, if you want to make a beautiful knot that is like a stevedore's knot or a lover's knot or, you know, a true promise knot, these are all names of knots. There are hundreds of knots from so many different kinds of cultures, each of which has been invented by different people to function, to make things possible, to carry load, to make beautiful rosettes when you're doing embroidery. So knots can be done by intention, uh, which cannot be taken apart, but are intended not to be taken apart. And I think it is this play between intention and, and the everyday that we want to bring awareness of. Just to take your analogy further, um, I mean, we, we've been working with a book called The Ultimate Book of Knots, which is like a list of 200 knots. And amongst them, of course, is the noose, which is the hangman's knot, right? Um, but that is one amongst many kinds of knots. And the, the interesting thing about the question of a collective is that a collective is always a collection of divergent intelligences and often conflicting wills, as is evidenced in the three people in front of you. A mob is like a hydra with a singularity of the will. It unites for specific purposes, and then it dissipates again. A collective is drawn, in my understanding, through a, a conflict of wills that continues to stay within the idea of dissensus, that continues to work with its own dissensus. Just as mobs can be lethal, so can be assassins and suicides, which is the ultimate individual act. So I think that these questions that you rightly raised point us to a, and it's good that we are having this discussion because there is an assumption that a form of art practice or a form of being together is somehow a marker of its own innocence. I don't think, we don't think that that exists. Collectives are not necessarily ethically better forms of being or practice. They have to understand their ethical premises almost on a daily basis, which is that they have to ask themselves every day, why are we still here and why are we still together? which is not necessarily something that is demanded of 
more monadic forms of practice. But th that is not to say that collectives are innocent. Juntas are collectives. Uh, thanks a lot. Just to continue with the provocation, and actually should I almost reply to my question. Um, so I, with some colleagues, I, 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 write, I was writing something and we kind of came up with this um, idea of the will to collaborate. You know, if one could summarize the sign of this time, <laughs> you know, and of course, I mean, this session is, the sessions are, you know, testify to this. And I always get stuck, you know, like, because my next question is always, what's wrong with solo work? Nothing. Yeah. But then, you know, how do you explain the will to collaborate? You know, so it's, I, I keep, I, I, it's, I'm in a, in a loop, right? So I just want some, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, if take me a, out of this if loop. If there Thank is you. a will to collaborate, then huh. there must be somewhere beneath that will a desire. And if there is a desire, all desires do not need to find fruition. I mean, the fruit of literature is full of unrequited love. These are unfructified desires. But if there is a desire, then we, can, we have to face the desire. But there's also, if I can add just one thing, there's also kind of a moral component there, right? Uh, if we think of uh, collectives versus solo artists, I mean, I'm, I'm, of course I'm thinking of practice here. Um, and also in other fields, right? So there is a kind of component that, you know, it carries some extra sort of uh, ethical value, a higher. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, so I just wanted to, uh, you know. I, I think, you know, uh, Manuel, the, the, it's not a higher value. The thing is, like, take for example a university. You have a professor, but professor needs a faculty. So one of the reasons that we are trying to, one of the things that we're trying to develop in the series of essays we're writing is on the idea of the associative. So one of, the collective in solo, is collective is not in relationship to solo. Collective has to be seen in a relationship to corporatist, where actually huge collectives are formed to determine other ways of how life will be produced. Uh, like a Silicon Valley stories are corporatist collectives. So one of the things that one, we try to think now is not relationship to solo artists, because I think the solo artist, uh, that kind of is a delayed response will slowly disappear. The, 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 like the Wrong Rupa's uh, documenta has been read as an attack on solo artists, completely misreading. What they are attack, if at all it was, what they are trying to propose is a different logic of associative practice. That's why you can say 1,200 artists participated in Documenta without really naming them, and it's proliferating. One of, that's why this talk is called proliferating protagonism. What is this associative logic? This associative logic is continuously asking the question of when I am proli proliferating or I am live in a world of multiple proliferations, how do I participate and move in it? And this question is asked by collective in an interesting way than a solo artist. And on the other side, the corporatist ask this question continuously, but they produce a, not a protagonist, but they produce a consumer. So one of the, one of the crucial questions for collectives today is to ask, reframe this question for the world. Who is this proliferating protagonism that they are continuously associating and needing in their practice? And I can see it in many, many utterances, many discussions over the last two, three years actively, and over the last two decades I've seen it, and we have, been, we have many notes through it, but now we understand this relationship a little bit formally in terms of a conceptual. And we can see the, the lot of universities, faculties are collapsing. One of the reasons is they're not able to produce associative logic of their existence. So the departments can be closed, and they may have a one star, but rest are even forgotten. One of the reasons is that is not able to produce why a faculty is needed, why you need a group of people together to work as a, as a department or as a subject. You know? so, and this question, I think, now is getting more and more interesting in our this decade onwards, and especially with this, what they call the new liberal attack is basically trying to displace the associative away. And there's one more thing I, I will just take. One of the legal judgments uh, that came up last two years back in the Supreme Court of India 
and the Kanvilkar, he proposed that the associative logic of a national citizen, a subject, is to be governed by the state. So what it means that how the citizen is going to associate in the world is state's vision cannot be obstructed. So you can understand this problem. It is not the solo versus the collective. It is different imagination of the associative living uh, that is under scrutiny and the collective has a new stake in it, a, a much more profound stake than probably the solo artist ever had. So that's the, the question has to be reframed. It's a, it's Thank a different, you. It's a different, different question altogether. I'm not entirely sure what you're arguing because what, uh, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that there is some sort of association which is like withering away or being... Associative. But I mean, I'm Capacity just like, because, because basically, uh, you know, like collectives, it's a very, very old thing. It's a very old history and it's not a singular history. I'm just thinking of the whole idea of a corporation which is literally the collective, but collective with a completely different motive, which is to accumulate, uh -huh. to enhance, and to grow and grow and grow, to yeah. pull things together, but in a different direction than what we would understand, uh, you know, with the language of solidarity that we're talking about. So I think perhaps we also need to, uh, you know, break down, uh, you know, what you were saying into uh, you know, what precisely is being removed or being erased, because I'm not totally convinced that this is to, uh, taking place. No, no, not erased or leave. Not erased or leave. I'm answering in relation to solo artist. The debate is not solo versus collective. Achha, the I'll debate stop. is different visions of associative life. And this visions of associative life is that the kernel, you know, we the people in this constitution where India is the classic, very rarely in India you will find people say we the people. But the preamble became in the last, the demonstrations in the last four years in India, one of the reason you will find the demonstration very poignant, and some philosophers are writing about it, is that people are continuously narrating it as a preamble, we the people. So because in India you won't find people, have this idea of the we the people is a very difficult utterance. It has, it has appeared. But, so this is that associative life that is now being rethought. And I think what I was saying is the debate is not to stage the solo artist versus the collective. That's not the debate. The debate is the different imagination of associative life and collective has a stake in it. That's all I'm saying. I mean, it's interesting to note that legally, corporations are known as judicial legal persons. Right? So it's even as if that the associative logic, which is corporatist, has to take recourse to the language of individuation while asserting its primacy. Whereas a collective may be thought of as that we the people which is never one, which has to contend with all its conflicts and not be that resolved legal fiction of the singular person. I mean, that's why when we gestured to the work which is about the molecular human, we are perhaps suggesting that even the body itself is, is a coalition of chemical elements, but also different forms of life. So that what drives me towards hunger, for instance, in the middle of the day, is not necessarily just my will, but also the, the desires of the colonies of, of multicellular and single cellular organisms that need nourishment for themselves, which makes me feel oddly hungry. So this new mode of thinking about not the, not the logic of, of associations becoming legal persons, but persons themselves seen through the prism of, of, of the associative. I mean, this question about whether the solo artist or the collective is better or worse, is a question that would never occur, for instance, in mathematics or in astronomy. astronomy. Because the data sets that mathematicians and astronomers are working with require a dialogic, verificatory language. They cannot, mathematicians search for proof and proof in the eyes, or disproof in the eyes of others. 
And un until and unless that, that peerage appears, mathematics cannot settle itself, and which is why the collective in mathematics is not necessarily even within a generation. It can occur across generations. And what we are suggesting is that collectivity is not just a question of responding to the crises of the world as it is today in one place or another place, but it's also a new mode of, not a new, a very old, and a, very, and a slightly different mode of thinking about the relationship between the self, the world, and the constituent elements, that's all. We didn't, I didn't, we didn't, you should ask Manuela. <laughs> Manuela is a good How do you seriously distinguish between what is solo and what is collective? We, we didn't. It is literally, is it uh, the number of bodies which are involved no, no, no. or, you know, once three of and us or the room here it's decides a, that we will go no, in a, a single direction. It's a different idea of number. It's yeah. not an idea of no, the no, number of bodies. No. It's a different idea of number. No, no, I come, uh, wait, that's, wait. that's my point. That's my point. If all of us in this room decide that we have a common purpose and we will begin walking in one direction, we do fuse into one. We become solo in some way, right? Yes. It's only by retaining some sort of disagreements and frictions in this room that we may also, I don't know, that's what I'm asking. How do you differentiate between what is solo and what no, is no, collective? See, solo, solo is not the word we use. Solo is Manuela's term. I think it comes from yeah, anthropology you. of art, not from artists. But so, see, if, if you take Whitman, we, we are the multitude. If you take, it's the multitude as a part of self is a very long philosophical journey whether it is Buddhism, Hinduism, everywhere. All mystic tradition has the idea of the multitude of the self. Solo, the idea of the solo is a very new thing. And it, is, it comes as a reference. I'm saying collective can be looked at independently of the solo. But if you discuss solo, we can disband the solo by idea that philosophically, nobody can hold the solo. We now know, enough, there is enough philosophy, it's very difficult, you will hold it practically. But philosophically, you can't hold the idea of the solo. Well, we can discuss it later, but what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that very simple. Solo is not what our concern is. Our concern is when we are thinking the associative, in the what the collective is proposing is a different mode of associative. That it is wants to associate with the world materially, and in relationship to other people, and it is producing that challenge to the world, and that is the question we are trying to raise here and bring it here, okay, that is the question for us. It is not because of, the, because of some other way of looking at art history or art or something like that. It is not a quarrel with established art history. <laughs> we, we had that quarrel too many years. So. Let's say it's acupuncture. <laughs> you know, in acupuncture, you can press here, you get a relief here. So it's like that. It's the associative logic of the body. The Chinese look at the body associatively. So I press it here, I get some eye blinking, you know, like, a bit like that. I'm thinking more about the canopy. And I was wondering how we decode it a bit further. The canopy is, of course, a protection and a shelter, as you say. But it's also cover. And in a time of deep censorship and concealment, how do we also think about the canopy? I mean, the canopy is, on one hand, a fabric, the shamiana, but it's also the tree canopies. 
that allow you to be protected from the rain. So it's a mesh, it's translucent, and things are moving through. Um, so how do we kind of also think about the canopy as something that can allow us to say what we cannot say and not say what we can say and to think about conversations differently and language. Can, can a canopy be a form of language? I think my response to you is to turn it the other way around. Language is always a canopy. It's always something we take shelter into, not the shelter only of words, because I think it's also the fact that all languages express silence somewhat differently. Since you talked about canopies, and we, met, we gestured to a term that is used in botany called overstory. So you have undergrowth, and overstory is the is what is overhead, it's, and there's this phenomenon, there's a beautiful term that we like very much called crown shyness, which sort of pertains to this relationship between individuality and the collective, that the roots of trees may be enmeshed, but their crowns take care not to touch each other so that there can be equal distribution of moisture and sunlight, which is also a form of refuge for the individual organism that is a tree, but also a form of refuge that one tree extends to another by not encroaching on its space. And as you know well, we have always seen the work that artists do as being both overground, but also slightly, shall we say, undercover, right? And this business of being undercover, of being creating languages that are composed temporarily of stealth, temporarily of encoding things so that we both make things clarified for understanding, but also keep them protected from forms of scrutiny that may render them precarious. So the holding space of the aesthetic then becomes a space of refuge, of shadows, of not necessarily making oneself transparent all the time. Sometimes, but not all the time. I thought it was over. The, and she proposes luminosity against the idea of an enlightenment, which is, doesn't against, but she says, take luminosity seriously because luminosity allows you movement between gray uh, zones of shades. You know, you can have darkness, you can, you know, move, it can flicker, it can go off. So I think somewhere we have been trying to work it out for the last few years to find the vocabulary that gives it some space to a certain form of multiplicity, a shadow play, a life that allows for a different kind of multiplicity of artistic practice emerge. Otherwise, uh, this pressure of the enlightened light can actually have a very, very blinding effect and a, and a kind of a, can in, incinerate uh, life. So it has to be a little more, little more, and, the, and Svetlana Baum's art essay, where she draws friendship between women as our way to think the idea of friendship, not friendship producing knowledge, but friendship producing a real living idea of how to live with shadows, how to live with a deep sense of shade and shadow. You know, so I think we have to have a different ontology of friendships, of ideas, to actually alert us to this new form of thinking we have to do. Not like always truth to power kind of. Hey, okay, whoa. Um, so in a lot of what y'all are describing, I'm still, maybe I'm interpreting this wrong, but I'm hearing a lot of form in how... Oh, oh, oh can you hear me now? Okay, amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, and maybe I'm interpreting this wrong, but form in how the collective is being described, like, you know, even in the multiplicity that it might embody. So I'm curious what y'all would think about 
like you know a sleeper cell as a for, as a collective is that you know like you know where you would want to avoid the f sort of formal definition and it kind of helps it stay um is that still a kind of collectivization or is it like you know it cuz it you kind of don't want to see it right it's like different kind of forms that yeah yeah just want to avoid being seen um what yeah what does that do or what is that a kind of yeah collective coming together like how how would you think about that we have no quarrel with it I'm not sure I quite understand the query. Are you saying that those people who have chosen to be withdrawn but to maintain a kind of network, is that a more or less of a collective? Is that what you're asking me? Because in a way, the question of being collective is not a, is not a description of its intentionality, right? The intentionality question is, um, is frankly the next question, and which is what we were also trying to talk about is the question of, of um, of ethics, right? Of interpersonal and intrapersonal ethics and of, of, of trans, transpersonal ethics. And I think this is the question that we, you know, it seemed perhaps not necessary to talk about so much in this, in this gathering, but it remains at the heart of, the, of, of, you can choose whatever form you wish to embody, uh, consciously or unconsciously, whether you are a singular multitude or a multitude of singularities, but then what do you do with that? Um, becomes another important thing. For example, we think that the idea of manifesto is, um, not, we do not believe in the manifesto, right? Because we think that when you have a manifesto and you come together for something, it is, not, it is, it is coming together to do an action. Is, you can, of course, we can have another debate about it, but it, to me it's not collectivity in that sense because I'm interested in the fact how do you live with the other at an everyday level. So collectivity more as a form of of engaged living rather than collectivity coming together for function. So it's, it's not perhaps so much a, um, a distinction that seems obvious at the, at, from the outside, but it is a way of thinking about how one wishes to um, find an order of life itself. So I think the question of whether a sleeper cell is a form of collective or whether we are momentarily a form of collective, these are things that are to do with intentionality and to do with what happens from that, but not necessarily when I'm looking at the idea of the collective from. Spies, classic spies, 20 years, 30 years, they could be sleeping and uh, so it's, it, it has been the old story. The sleeper cell has suddenly become a CIA language which is propagated, but it's like a different thing. But the story of spies, if you re read all the history of spies, it is that they can go dormant for years. But that's a different logic of collective. It's not collective. It's a different geological principle has to apply there. It can go dormant, you know. And so, and collective, the way you will see artistic collectives work, they are assertive of their living in the world and they're assertive of their, like this beautiful thing about a spring can bring a collective, imaginary collective in, in life, you know. And that's, that's the kind of, principle, and that's the kind of thought that you can have to think about. Someone, two young people sitting in Amsterdam can produce a huge collective in their mind. It's an imaginary space, and they don't, they don't enact sleeping, you know? So, and I think it will be important to read the stories of spy and find a language which is not necessarily a collectivistic imagination, you know, it's something else. <laughs> 